Welcome to Pause for Faith and welcome to this centenary of the birth of St. John Paul II. So So just to reflect with you a little bit about his life Um, But to say right at the beginning, I I don't want to give a a big biography or anything, but just to share a few personal thoughts about John Paul II and and the way the ways that our lives have connected. And it's not to put the focus on me, but just Pope John Paul II has meant so much for so many people. You can read a thousand biographies of him. You can see some wonderful films on YouTube. And I just want to use this time as an excuse to to remember him with you in a personal way. Just, it's a very special day. It's, it's the 18th of May, 2020, exactly 100 years since Karol Wojtyła was born in, I can never pronounce these amazing Polish words, is it Wadowice? You can correct me. Born there in Poland um, 100 years ago today. So just what a very special anniversary to remember this great saint and remember the beginning of his life 100 years ago. As I say, it's not to go through a, a biography of John Paul II. You can you can read a huge thousand page biography. You can look on Wikipedia. It's not even to analyse his pontificate. Yeah, who am I to do that? The highs and the lows, the light and the shadows. I'm I'm not here to defend him or to criticise him. It's it's too big for me. Just to share some personal stories and then in a personal way to get some little insights into his life and his teaching. So this is very subjective, but I hope it's enjoyable for you. I don't remember his election as Pope. I was, I think, 11, 1978. I wasn't Catholic. This wasn't my world at all. I probably knew there was a Pope, I think, but honestly, I don't remember. So there we go, his election. I think the first memory I have with him on the edge of my consciousness was when he visited the United Kingdom in 1982. I was 15 then. Again, he just wasn't on my map at all. I'm sure there was some news, but I wasn't reading newspapers then. But I had a Catholic friend who went to the local school in the same town as me. She went with her mum to see John Paul II. Maybe it was at Coventry. Maybe they got up at four in the morning, got a coach with school to Coventry. So I have a vague memory of this being a big thing for her. Then lots of jumps here. I became Catholic in March 1986. And this is just a bit of strange social history. But it's interesting to look back. I had hardly any consciousness of the Pope then when I became Catholic. Maybe that's weird. Maybe it was normal then. This was pre-internet pre-social media. I didn't read any Catholic news. I didn't didn't know any teenagers that did. You know, people were not on social media, on news sites, on blogs, on, on Twitter. Just there was I, a, a young person living an ordinary secular life, thinking about the church. I came to faith through books and the Bible and the sacraments and my ordinary local parish in Harpenden and Father Maurice O'Leary, my local parish priest and prayer, and knowing one or two Christians, I didn't become Catholic because of this huge Catholic world on the internet or social media or or Catholic newspapers. It It just wasn't like that then. So I became Catholic, and as I said, I had hardly any consciousness of the Pope. Just there I was, a new Catholic, instructed by my parish priest, received by my parish priest, going to mass in my local church. Went off to university that summer, and the following summer, the end of my first year at university, that was the first time I met him. So here's, I forgot to get it off the wall. I'm getting my my photo off the wall. I showed this to some of you the other day. I can't remember why. I was talking about the saints. So here we go. There is young Stephen Wang. Um, I think I'm age 20 then. So this is before seminary, meeting John Paul II. It's the only photo I've got of me with a saint. So I'm very proud of this. It hangs on my wall um, and everyone sees it coming into my office. Why am I as a 20 year old university student meeting the Pope? Well, it was complete. It was completely random. Um, 
end of my first year, I decided to go on holiday to Italy, also as a new Catholic. So I was excited about going to Rome, but it was just a, a, a great summer holiday for a university student, traveling around, getting the train. And when we got to the to Rome, we happened to be staying because of some contacts I'd made at university in the Irish college in Rome. And as I say, completely random, the night that we arrived at the Irish college to stay, just treating it as a hotel, we booked in and the receptionist said, oh, by the way, we didn't know this, all of the Irish bishops are staying at the Irish college for their ad limina, which is when all the bishops of a country come to meet the Pope. Tomorrow morning at six o'clock, there's a coach going from the Irish College to Castle Gandolfo, to, to the Pope's summer residence, for the bishops and everyone who's in the Irish College, do you want to come? <laughs> so, of course, we said yes. The, the, the morning after we arrive, hardly any sleep, we get on a coach in Rome, go to Castle Gandolfo, just up in the mountains, have mass with Pope John Paul II um, in, in this beautiful chapel in Castle Gandolfo and have a brief, there were about, I don't know, it wasn't a small group, two or three hundred people there, maybe a couple of hundred people. And we all filed past him. Um, he was in, despite the assassination attempt just a few years before, he was in reasonable health there, still a relatively young man. Um, before the Parkinson's and the struggles of later life, um, me meeting the Pope in his prime, really, and just very friendly and warm. I don't remember what he said, but he shook my hand. I got the photo. He gave me a rosary. That's what you do. And this was my main rosary until it fell apart. And I can't find it now because it broke into lots of little pieces. Um, but just a lovely memory of meeting the Pope completely unasked for and unexpected. And, and my other memory is the, the Irish priest I was with, he said, oh, Stephen, I'm going to meet the Pope. You must take lots of photos with me because he because he was celebrating. So on his behalf, I spent the whole mass jumping up to take these photographs of this priest with Pope John Paul II celebrating mass for him to send to his mum or whatever. Um, and, and I realised at the end of the Mass that I hadn't been praying and I was really annoyed with myself that I treated this event and the Pope like a celebrity. And I learned a lot from then. And in fact, I think I almost took a resolution then not to have a camera for a few years after that, because I wanted to experience the moment and be present to people instead of just being present at one stage removed from them. So... I came back to university. I got on with university life. I was thinking about vocation and priesthood. Eventually, at the end of that time, the three years after university, I was really doing a lot of discernment with the Dominicans. Should I become a Dominican? Eventually, I saw the light. I have great love for the Dominicans. I saw the light, um, felt the call very strongly, very clearly to become a diocesan secular priest applied to Westminster Diocese, my home diocese where my family lived, went to interviews, was accepted. And this was the way it was in those days. I just got a letter in the post saying, Dear Stephen, you're accepted for the priesthood. We'd like you to go to Rome in, in September. Full stop. Um, signed by the rector of the seminary on behalf of, of, the, of Cardinal Hume, the bishop who sent me to seminary. So that was it. No discussion, just okay, we're off, you're going to Rome. I arrived at Rome in 19, in, um, sorry, in 1992. I might have got my dates modelled there. Yeah, I applied to seminary in the spring of, of 92 and went to Rome in 1992. And it was very simple to sum up. John Paul II was the Pope of my five years in Rome. So of course, even if he hadn't have been a saint, he was just a huge part of my life, just as Everyone living in Rome will look back and say, yes, this Pope or these Popes were a bit, big part of my life, just like seminarians today and Pope Francis. The first week we were there as seminarians, we were taken to a, an audience with John Paul II, with thousands of other people in the Paul VI Hall. I think that's what it's called. So great, great fun, great fanfare, great dignity until he started walking around. And when he started walking around, that was when the chaos erupted. I'm not joking. Chairs flying, elbows 
in the in the eye or in the chest with people fighting to get to the front row and to be able to see him or to shake his hand. So there was a genuine love here, but there was also a little bit of the celebrity thing going on, which is inevitable. Um, and it was just interesting to see that, yeah, that this great love and affection, but also the world of, of popes and of celebrities and of crowds, um, which I'd missed really when I was in that very quiet moment of prayer in the chapel with him at the beginning. His writings and teachings played a huge part of, of life, it formed a, a huge part of our life in Rome then. His older writings before I arrived were just part of the background that had already influenced the church and seminary formation. And in my time in Rome, we were there as they came hot off the press, these incredible writings, the encyclical Veritatis Splendor in 93, Evangelium Vitae about the gospel of life in 95, Ut Unum Sint about the importance of ecumenism um, in the same year and just after I, I left in 98, Fides et Ratio. So huge, profound writings about the moral vision of, of the Christian life, about human life and dignity, about ecumenism and Christian unity, about faith and reason and dialogue and, and so much more. And he was such a big part of seminary life for us in a particular way because of the document that he wrote, Pastores Darbo Vobis. Pastores Darbo Vobis, translated meaning, I give you shepherds. And this was what was called a post-synodal apostolic exhortation, meaning the, the, the document that came after a synod, a big meeting of the, the bishops of the church, which was about priestly formation. This document was published in March 92, just months before I arrived in Rome. So it was the core of the vision of seminary when I was there, just beginning. In other words, seminary formation in the year that I started was being transformed because of this wonderful, wonderful document, Pastoros Darbo Vobis. It spoke about the four areas of formation for priests. Human, intellectual, spiritual, pastoral. And the danger that seminary can get narrow that you can treat seminary as a place you just do your studies or you learn to say your prayers. And John Paul II said, no, seminary is meant to be incredibly holistic, a, a rounded experience where all these different areas are integrated. Human formation, how, how we grow as, as human beings, as men, in our human maturity, in ourselves, in our relationships, in our community, who we are as persons. Intellectual formation, not academic. It includes the academic, but it's not just studying. It's the whole way that you think and learn and understand. It's, it's the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's your intellect in the broadest sense of your vision and understanding of the world. Spiritual formation, yes, Praying, your prayers, are you a man of prayer? But the whole interior life, the life of faith and virtue and friendship with God, with Jesus, the good shepherd. And pastoral formation, absolutely essential. The different experiences that we have serving and loving others in pastoral relationships, how we understand God's holy people, the church, our love for others, our desire to serve, our desire, yes, to be a spiritual father as a priest, but to be a brother, a friend, a servant, a disciple with our brothers and sisters. All of this was influencing our seminary formation in my years of 92 to 97. And the first years of Pastoris Darbo Vovis, we really benefited from this in, in, in those early years. There was a real attempt by the rector and the team to share this vision with us. There were lots of mistakes and failures, but genuine desires to put this vision of John Paul II. And this document of his affected me very personally, actually. In my fifth year, before I was ordained a deacon, coming up to 
the promises of diaconate, I had a, quite a lot of doubts, actually. And, well, I was going to say maybe crisis is too strong, but let's call it a mini crisis. Certainly lots of questions and unclarity about what God wanted, whether this was right for me. Is this what God wants? How does he call me to serve others, but also to be myself as well, and not in a way that denied who I felt I was and what God was calling me to? How could I follow this vocation and be true to myself? And whenever I was in some kind of <laughs> mini crisis or meltdown, I would often just escape from, from seminary and university. So I just took the day off lectures. I said, I've had enough, that's it. And I would go to the, the chapel of the Little Sisters of Jesus at Tre Fontane, near that beautiful church where St. Paul was beheaded. And I would just have a day of retreat there. And, and this one day in early 1997, um, I took Pastor Isdabo Vobis with me, the document of John Paul II. And I read the section about Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and of how Pope John Paul saying that priestly love is about giving your heart to others, sharing your life with others. That celibacy is not just a sacrifice, but a gift of love. It allows you to love in a special way and to be open to being loved by others in a special way. And I remember sitting on the bench in the back of the chapel and a sense of peace really overwhelming me as I read these words of John Paul II, feeling like it was an answer from heaven, some clarity, as if the bits of my life and heart and desire came together in that moment and I could see priesthood as a gift, as an invitation, but also a way of being true to myself and, and being true to others, a way of life that made sense of my deepest desire to, to serve, but also to love and to be loved. And, and I found great freedom and peace and light in that moment. And I'm so grateful to John Paul II, to the Lord and to the sisters at Trey Fontane. I guess in effect, at that moment, I took the decision to be ordained and I'd love to visit that chapel again. I've never had time. John Paul II touched our lives in much less dramatic ways. He was just the Pope down the road. St Peter's is about a 10 minute walk from the English college where, where we lived. He was like almost our parish priest. It was before 9-11, before security and scanners and security guards you could just wander in to pray it was my regular church for confession once a fortnight it was just the church down the road so yes you could get papal audience tickets for the wednesday audience that was very special but the best thing was that just pope john paul ii as pope benedict as pope francis he prayed the angelus every sunday at noon so it was lovely that any Sunday, especially if you had visitors from England or somewhere, anyone visiting Rome knew that they could just go and see the Pope, hear him, see him, pray with him without a ticket. It's very democratic. Yeah. So just what a gift it was for us when friends were visiting just to wander down the road and go to St. Peter's and pray with John Paul II. And this was our regular routine at the English College. Very often, Sunday Mass, I can't remember, was it 10 o'clock or something? Beautiful Mass, liturgy, prayer. Then walking down the cobbled streets to St. Peter's Square, um, milling around in the sunshine, um, listening to the words of the Pope in the Angelus, often giving a 10-minute talk, a little homily, really, praying with him, praying for him, praying the Angelus together. And then walking up the Lago Argentina um, and just sitting down at a particular bar very near the Chiesa Nuova, near the Philip Neri Church, having a coffee and coming back for a delicious Italian lunch at the English College. So there were some perks to being in Rome. So very general, very normal. This was the life of being a seminarian. And I guess it probably is in many ways now. Um, I know it is. Much doesn't change in Rome. But just to tell three stories about the three times I met him personally. This is a bit personal, um, but I'm just sharing it with you because I've got the camera and I've got the time. 
but also it says maybe something about JP2 as well. The first experience was um, when I was at the English College, we would have a pastoral placement as seminarians every year. The mythology is that when someone goes to study at the English College as a seminarian in Rome, they get cut off from the pastoral reality of the church and of ordinary people. This is the mythology. It wasn't my experience. We had a fantastic pastoral director. We had pastoral commitments every week of, of every month of every year in my five years at Rome. One year I was working with a first communion group doing catechesis, another year with a confirmation group. Um, another year we set up and run a young Christian workers group for English speakers in the college. I was going to a, a, a parish in the suburbs of Rome to lead a Bible study house community with, with a wonderful couple who are dear friends, Sandro and Pier Luigi Ferrari, who, who ran a, a Bible study with their parish priest in their, in their home, and I was part of that. But one year, I was on placement working in the youth centre of San Lorenzo, which again says something about John Paul II. He was Pope, he was travelling around the world, but he said, we've got to do something for the young people of my parish, St Peter's, the people who come here. So he set up a youth centre called San Lorenzo, staffed by priests and, and, and volunteers and seminarians like myself. I went there one afternoon a week. We welcomed people into the lovely church on the Via Conciliazione, right near St. Peter's Square. And we went out to evangelise, to talk to people, to sing songs, to greet people in St. Peter's Square and to share faith and just to be a welcoming presence in St. Peter's Square. And one day we were invited to Mass with John Paul II. Just we, we got an invitation next week, Thursday morning, whatever, come to his private Mass. And it was a really, really beautiful experience. I remember going to this little chapel up in the, the Vatican somewhere, about 25 people. We went an hour early because the Pope would always have an hour's prayer and meditation. And I've just got this, you can see photos of of this many times over, but I've just got this image of sitting in this little chapel, kneeling in this chapel, with John Paul II in his frailty, kneeling on the kneeler, the predia, and on the lid of the kneeler was a, a box, the lid in effect, with all the intentions that had come to him, the intentions of the church and, and special intentions that people had asked him to pray for. And he knelt for an hour in, in stillness and in prayer and in intercession before the Blessed Sacrament, praying for the needs of the church and the world and, and deep in contemplation. And just what a gift without any fanfare, without any cameras and spotlights, just, just to be praying with him. And that is one of the hours of prayer that I treasure the most, that this, the silent prayer of the Mass the silent prayer before the mass of his morning sharing his morning prayer and then the prayer of the mass the second time i met john paul ii again it was very random but just very blessed my dear mum came to visit in rome seminarians were often having parents visit mum wasn't in great health for much of her life and, and often needed to use a wheelchair so she came to rome um, we used the wheelchair when we were traveling around um, in the taxi and we managed to get two tickets to, I can't remember, I think it was a mass in St. Peter's Square. Was it an audience? Anyway, there we were with thousands of people. Um, and of course, we knew this, the hope that he might meet the sick people, but you never knew. And in fact, there were hundreds of bishops and dignitaries and the good and the great that needed to meet John Paul II at the end of this Mass. Um, and there was no guarantee, but just it was really beautiful to be there praying with my dear mum, who's gone to the Lord now, to be at Mass with the Pope. And at the end of the Mass, when all the bishops and the the good and the great had disappeared, that he then made that extra time to come and meet the sick who were who were waiting, the those who were using wheelchairs and, and those who were accompanying them and those in, in special needs. And it was just a lovely moment for him to bless all of those and to bless mum individually. And a beautiful photograph of John Paul II I've got with him, with his 
hand blessing my mum's head. And the last time I met him personally, again, very random, 1997, another huge anniversary, the 1400th anniversary of St. Augustine coming from St. Gregory's Monastery in Rome to convert the Southern English tribes. So the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, came to San Gregorio. There was a solemn mass, sorry, solemn vespers with the Archbishop of Canterbury, John Paul II. And because we were the deacons at the English College on this great English celebration, we were invited to serve. So just the, the real privilege of serving vespers with John Paul II um, and meeting him in the sacristy afterwards. But even then in 97, being really struck by his sickness. It's incredible. He lived for another eight years and his health went up and down. But just it wasn't just the last months of his life. It was the last years that were full of suffering for him. When I finished seminary in 97, I just went straight into parish life. Four beautiful years in Dollis Hill in North London, um, just really one of the happiest times of my life, completely absorbed in parish life, the people, the schools, the hospitals, the parish team, little reading and little connection with the larger church, really. But back to JP2, I was so lucky to go on two World Youth Days in that time. First as a deacon in 97, my first World Youth Day. Um, in Paris, and just the massive impact it made on me. Yeah. Um, I take it for granted now. I've been to so many. I'm used to being in these crowds. But to go as a new deacon, travelling with Westminster Diocese, the, 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 pil the sense of pilgrimage and the adventure and the excitement and the meetings, but then walking into Longchamp Racecourse with, I don't know, 800,000 people or something in that field on the Saturday evening seeing John Paul II in the distance as he baptised 12 people symbolically from six different continents, sleeping in the open air, and then waking up in the morning to have mass with him. And at the end of that beautiful mass, it was when he made the announcement to the whole church that St. Therese of Lisieux would be made a doctor of the church. So just, I can remember these very particular moments, the baptisms, the sleeping, the waking up, the struggle to get to the toilet. That was the World Youth Day with no toilets. And um, getting up for Mass and the joy of the Mass and the joy. I've got a great devotion to St. Therese of hearing that she would be made a doctor soon. And the last time um, I saw him, I think, was World Youth Day for the Millennium in 2000 in Rome. Getting those coaches from Westminster Diocese, travelling overnight to, to northern Italy and then, then on to Rome. Um, the, the celebrations, the catechesis, the, just Rome being overcrowded with, with young people. And then coming into Tor Vergata, this field on the edge of Rome, walking out there in the heat. And just the, the awe, the awe-inspiringness of a field with literally two million people in it. The sense of space and light and, and the, the vastness of it, but the intimacy as well, feeling that we are here together to pray together as a church, as young people, as a community. Um, and seeing John Paul II for the last time come by in the Jeep, the Pope Mobile, just twisting around so that everyone could see him. And as he came by and people rushing to see him in the twilight, the joy, but a little bit of sadness. He was so sick then. And just thinking... Gosh, is he gonna is he gonna manage this? He, here's this very frail man in, in a grandfatherly way on the in the Pope Mobile coming round to wave and smile and bless people, but but looking very, very frail. But then when the liturgy began on that evening, I think it was Vespers or something or exposition, when he spoke that evening, the, the crowds energized him and he spoke with such passion. And and it really, you didn't know his age. He, he was a man, a spiritual father, a brother. And I know this is a bit of a cliche and it, people say it about lots of people who are very charismatic. But I felt and I know so many, the two million others and the people around me, 
It was as if John Paul II was speaking to one's heart. It was really as if this man on a huge screen, half a mile away, two million people away in this vast crowd was speaking to each one of us as if he was speaking the same words he must have spoken as a university chaplain in Krakow, as a, as a bishop in Poland, as, as a young pope when he came out onto the balcony that first day when he was elected and said, do not be afraid. It was the same heart and the same man speaking to us. And as I say, it must be the Holy Spirit. It's not just a human charisma, the sense that here was a father, a brother, a friend speaking to us, telling us not to be afraid, to to know the love of Jesus and, and to share that love. And just lovely, lovely that my final memory of John Paul II personally is that incredible moment of speaking and, and listening and praying at World Youth Day in 2000. There's so much in his life to thank God for. I've, I've been very personal. That, I mean, I can read you out a biography of his if you like. You can look it up. I thank the Lord, especially today, for the hundred years since his birth. And just it's not just about him. The huge love that I have for Pope Francis, for Pope Benedict, and the gratitude to God for, for Pope Francis today and for Pope Emeritus Benedict still in in reasonable health and, and full of energy today, such gratitude for them. It's not about comparing popes, it's just about saying, I guess there's a very special significance of John Paul II for me and for many people. For me, because he was the pope when I became Catholic, so he was my first pope. He was the pope when I grew into my faith. He was the pope when I was at seminary and when he was, as I've said, the the, the parish priest down the road, writing and speaking and, and part of my, my daily and weekly life. Um, so a time to look back on his life, but really to thank God for him and his faithfulness and his holiness. Please read about him. Yeah, read something online. There's some great biographies. Um, and if you're stuck, don't know where to start, there's a wonderful film called Carol, spelt the Polish way, K-A-R-O-L. Just search for Carol film about John Paul II. You'll find it easily. I don't know if it's on Netflix or Amazon. Um, you can certainly buy the DVD. Um, a, a beautiful film. And I haven't seen part two about his papacy, but I've seen the first film, part one, which is about all of his life leading up to when he was elected. And it's a lovely way into his life. Thank God for Pope St. John Paul II. Let's finish with a prayer. Please pray with me to Pope John Paul II. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O blessed Trinity, we thank you for having graced the Church with St John Paul II, and for allowing the tenderness of your fatherly care, the glory of the cross of Christ, and the splendour of the Spirit of love to shine through him. Trusting faithfully in your infinite mercy and in the maternal intercession of Mary, he has given us a living image of Jesus the Good Shepherd. He has shown us that holiness is the necessary measure of ordinary Christian life and is the way of achieving eternal communion with you. Grant us by his intercession and according to your will the graces we implore through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Saint John Paul II, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lovely to have this time with you. Thanks for sharing it. Um, if you're streaming live now, I'm not streaming tonight as normal because I've got meetings this evening. So we'll be back tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock UK time. God bless you and um, have a good day. <laughs>